I vow to withhold imperial law without exception. Cal Avarium was not human. Even in her recent portrait, featured in the latest issue of Capital Weekly, she looked exactly like she had two years ago, from her porcelain, ageless skin to her silky, midnight hair. Cal was nothing but a lifeless statue of perfection. The sight of her name stopped Yashi with goosebumps on his arms. Someone had pasted Cal's article from Capital Weekly onto the exterior wall of Citra Market. She had been the only student from Citra selected for Belladonna Guardian Academy in decades, and the community prided itself in her success. The Belladonna Prodigy, Commander Cal of Citra, 18, breaks record as the youngest unit leader in Guardian history. The four-petaled flower emblem branded into her forehead marked her as a member of the Guardian Force. She was wearing the iconic uniform, which consisted of a dress shirt and tie, a vest with interior armor, and a black overcoat with golden lining. Her hair was slicked back into a low bun, not a single strand out of place. And yet, despite her powerful presence, she still looked like a child. Thunder struck. Yashi raised his head to catch the clouds darkening, and a few sprinkles met his cheek. He ensured the main road behind him was clear before peeling the article from the wall and tucking it into his book bag. The market door creaked open. Hey, just saw your father upstairs. Yashi hastily closed his bag. Alora, what are you doing here so early? Better question. What are you hiding in your bag? Homework. Homework? On selection day eve? I mean, I have a lot of missing assignments, so... Hmm... Alora hummed in curiosity as she ran her fingers against the brick wall. Silly move, Yashi. I saw the article about Cal on my way in. The paper's gone, but the glue residue isn't. See? Right here? He wiped his sweaty palms on his pants and cursed the summer heat for enhancing his nervousness. Sorry, I'll put it back. No need. You won't tell anyone about this, right? It never happened. Thanks. She leaned against the wall with narrowed eyes, and he studied her with equal intensity. He needed to know he could trust her word. I just hope you still remember how awful Chima was. He hurt a lot of people. But he never killed anyone. He probably would have. Eventually, considering the path he was on. Maybe if I tried to fight instead of running for help, he'd still be around right now. Bullying people. Hurting them. Killing them. Yeah, it's much easier to believe that, isn't it? Yashi strangled the shoulder strap of his bag, regretting his suspicious reply. The guardians in charge of Capital Weekly had publicized Cal's story clearly. After she spent four months behind bars, they ruled that she had saved her brother from a homicidal teenager and deserved a second chance for her pure intentions. Emperor Vakoy offered her both a pardon and a spot in the guardian program. Yashi knew better than to question that narrative publicly. Speaking up for Chima meant speaking low of Cal, and even a vague implication that the guardians had made a mistake could be interpreted as slander against the Force, a violation of Imperial law. Alora's gaze softened, and the raindrops dotting her shoulder-length hair resembled stars in the night sky. He decided he could trust her to keep this discussion between them. Hey, remember when we were in primary school, and we'd compete for the highest scores? That was a long time ago. <laughs> I miss it. Everything was simple back then. Things just worked without a thought, you know? I do. It stung to think of his old life, back when his friends looked up to him and students would return his smiles when he walked down the hall. He would study after school until the sun vanished and the crickets chirped louder than his thoughts, simply because the challenge fueled him. His instructors would praise Alora and him for their scores, and they would argue as though they actually cared who were smarter. But with a few swings of a log, it all slipped between his fingers. Alora opened a yellow umbrella as the sprinkle turned to rain. She owned a lot of yellow things. Yashi wondered if her favorite color was actually green. Maybe it's 
odd to say this, considering how we've hardly talked since the incident. But I still feel like I know you. And the people who say you lost your way are the same people who never really had the best scores back then. Sometimes I wonder if that means something. The rain started to dampen his shirt. Why are you telling me this? Because I think you're smart, Yashi. You always have been. And it scares me. He understood what Alora was hinting at, and it scared him too. The rabbit hole he'd fallen into offered nothing but destruction on the way down and loneliness at the bottom. As much as he would enjoy the company of someone else with the same fears, he would never wish to drag Alora with him. Not when she still had everything in her grasp. Sorry, I've gotta go. You know, help with the bread. Sure, okay. Alora smiled from under her umbrella, shielded from the rain. He envied her. I'll see you in class. Yashi entered the market, which was buzzing with talk of the following afternoon's selection ceremony. Long lines of customers led to wooden food stalls, but most had come to share their excitement, not shop. Two years had passed since Cal entered the program, and six months had passed since her graduation. It was time for the Guardians to announce the next cycle of 15 and 16-year-old trainees. As Yashi headed for his father's bread stall, two pesky classmates appeared next to him. Rumor has it that he failed every selection exam. Maybe it's time to go home, convert. You could join the underground, jar off some eyeballs. Yashi walked with a blank expression, and the students scattered before Martu Kanya could spot them. He found it ironic how they could shame him for being born in Eastern territory, yet still treat his father with respect. The word convert had become nothing but a cheap insult among teenagers who could hardly remember the events of the Atheris War themselves. Yashi joined Martu behind the table. Morning, father. It nearly sold out already? Everyone's in a good mood today. Optimism does wonders for business. One of their regular customers set two silver coins on the table, and Martu slipped the money into a velvet pouch. My, you're just in time. Bread's going fast. Yashi, get a wheat loaf ready. You remembered. I wouldn't dare forget a smile like yours. <laughs> Yashi could feel the woman's eyes on him as he wrapped her loaf in brown paper. Yashi, I remember when you were just a little one. You're of selection age now. Aren't you? Yeah, I am. Wow, time really does fly. I bet you did wonderfully on the selection exams. You were always a clever one. I did all right. Humble as always, I see. No, not humble. Just a liar. Yashi handed her the bread with a smile. Well, happy selection week. The woman left, and Yashi flinched as a girl stepped forward in her place. He nearly thought it were Cal pointing to a loaf of sourdough. She had the same silky hair and narrow face, but her skin was slightly darker, and when he stared into her blue eyes, they seemed real, not like Cal's, which he'd always described to himself as marbles. She looks a bit older than me, but I don't recognize her from Citrus Secondary. Yashi peeked up at her occasionally as he wrapped her sourdough bread. He would have been able to identify her hometown by the color of her shirt, but she wasn't dressed in a secondary school uniform. I wonder where she's from. The girl stole the bread from Yashi's outstretched hand and bolted for the door. Hey! Yashi stepped forward, but Martu caught him by the shoulder. Father, let me- No, leave her be. As the Eastern saying goes, have faith and kindness, and it will always repay you. But she stole from us. Eh, uh, what's one less loaf? It's not worth making a singing over on such a lovely day. So that's it? We let everything slide? People do horrible things and we just gloss it over like it never happened? Before his father could reply, a grand applause filled the room. Groups of residents dispersed, making way for 15-year-old Quaxivarium. He was dressed in the same citrus secondary uniform Yashi was wearing, but he pulled off the simple pants and green tee as though they composed a formal suit. Quax had started tailoring his clothes two years prior, after the Avariums received their family pension from Cal's first month at the academy. An expensive book bag from the Empire's capital, Vakoi City, hung over his shoulder, and his face, as usual, was beaming. The chattering softened as Quax approached Martu's stand, but the smiles and stares lingered. Morning, Martu. What a pleasure to see you. My, how you've grown. 
Martu ruffled Quax's hair, and Quax cringed through a smile as he flattened it back into place. I know, I know. It's been ages since I last came to the market. I've been so busy studying for the selection exams, but now that I'm finally through with them, I can't stop thinking about your bread. I'll take one of my favorites, if you still make it. Of course I do. Martu started to wrap a small cheesy bread. You've earned yourself a big day tomorrow. Yeah, tell me about it. Quax turned to Yashi with an obviously forced grin. Thought I'd walk to school early with Yashi today, for old time's sake. Oh, well, that sounds great, but it's still quite early. I need help with- Yashi, don't be ridiculous. We're nearly out of bread anyway. You two go on ahead. Thanks. Quax took the bread and set four coins on the table. Keep the change. Four coins? Why, thank you, Quax. Martu glanced at Yashi as though he were saying, I told you so. Kindness always finds a way to repay us. The clouds were still dark when Yashi and Quax stepped outside, but thankfully the rain had stopped. They walked down the main road towards Citrus Secondary, which was only a few minutes from the market. To their right stood the woods where the incident had taken place, and Yashi's gaze drifted between the trees. What are you looking at? Sorry. Yashi peeled his eyes away. I thought I heard something. Okay, well... I've been meaning to talk to you. Tried to find you at school yesterday after we got our selection exam scores back, but you disappeared after lunch. And I wasn't able to stop by your house last night either. We had my tutor over for dinner. Oh, sorry about that. Silence invaded their conversation. While Quax ate his cheesy bread, Yoshi shoved his hands into his pockets to keep from pulling at his fingers. He couldn't remember the last time they'd walked to school together like this. Quax had spent the past two years following in Cal's footsteps, obsessing over scores fitness, and social status to increase the chance of an academy guardian vouching for his spot in the program. He was always busy, and Yashi kept his distance. He couldn't bear to watch Quax distort himself into selection material. He remembered his evenings at the Avarium household, when Quax would drag him outside after dinner to demonstrate his latest hide-and-seek inventions, like setting up trip wires that triggered buckets to pour as distractions, or turning ditches into traps by concealing them in thin layers of cloth and dirt. Then they would lie on the grass, and Quax would tell Yashi about his grand dream of designing buildings with the most elaborate secret passageways. Yashi would listen closely and admire Quax's sense of purpose, because a grand dream was something he never had. And here Quax was, throwing that precious dream away. They arrived at the Citrus Secondary Courtyard. The other early students were watching a guardian unit secure a banner labeled Happy Selection Day, to a weathered outdoor stage. Yashi spotted Alora with his old group of friends, and he wondered if he were the only one who missed their games over lunch break. While Quack smiled at the guardians from afar, Yashi's gaze drifted to the fence that divided Citrus Secondary from the woods. The community infrastructure bonus from Cal's first month at the academy had funded its construction not long after the incident. Students weren't allowed to leave campus during breaks anymore. All right, look. Quax finally broke the silence, and they faced each other. I know you've been avoiding me. Avoiding you? Why would I do that? Because you don't want me to get selected. No, I mean, not no. Like, I don't want you to get selected. Of course I want you to get selected. I mean, I'll miss you, of course, but you deserve this. Really? Because I've been preparing for tomorrow for nearly two years, and you've hardly been there. You've been off trying to prove that there's something wrong with my sister. Quax crossed his arms. I really wish I could leave on good terms with my best friend. Because after tomorrow, I don't know when I'll see you again. It could be months. And if I graduate, it could be years before. Have you ever considered the possibility that you won't get selected? And honestly, would that be so bad? What if the Guardians aren't who you think they are? I knew it. You're still thinking about Chima. No, no, of course not. You're still feeding your conspiracy theories. You don't trust the Guardians, so you're trying to stop me from becoming one. I'm sorry, Quax. I shouldn't have. No, Yashi. You don't get to do that anymore. You don't get to sneak around and make ridiculous claims and then take it all back with an I'm sorry or an I didn't mean to. So for once, just once, tell me the truth. Did you, or did you not sabotage my last exam? What? Quax retrieved a score sheet from his book bag and handed it to him. Have a look for yourself. 
High 90s in every category except for our most recent exam. Do you really think I'd get a 63 on a multiple choice test about the Atheris War? It's not that you don't want me to succeed. You're just so brainwashed that you think you know what's best for me. This is your weird, twisted way of trying to save me. That's ridiculous. Of course I didn't sabotage your exam. I would never do anything like that. And how even? How would I possibly pull that off? <laughs> I don't know. You're the one who broke into the Furnace household last year. Just for the sake of your research. Yoshi scanned the courtyard, paranoid that the other students had heard quacks despite the distance. Chima's parents had moved to another town about a month after the incident, and Yoshi had climbed through an open window of their old home to search for anything that might paint Chima in a bad light. Perhaps if he could confirm that Chima truly would have killed quacks, he could put his questioning to rest, but the house was empty. He never should have told Quacks what he did that night, because it led to their first argument. While Yashi questioned whether Chima deserved to die, Quacks fought for Cal's innocence. From that point on, Yashi decided to keep his investigation a secret, even if it meant lying to his best friend. I know. That was all wrong, okay? But I stopped. I swear. Yeah? You swear? Open your bag then. Let me see what you're keeping in there. Because I have a feeling it isn't the hundreds of homework assignments you didn't turn in this term. Yashi shielded his bag, and Quacks chuckled bitterly. <laughs> of course. If I keep acting like this, he'll assume I'm lying anyway. I should at least try being honest with him. Yashi returned the score sheet to Quacks and reached into his own bag. Inside were about a dozen Capital Weekly articles covering Cal's detainment, selection, graduation, and as of that morning, promotion to unit leader. Two years of discreet collecting, annotating, and analyzing. Quack snatched the papers from Yashi's grip and began to flip through them. These are the articles I've been reading through. So yes, you're right. I guess I haven't stopped completely. But you have to believe me when I say that I had nothing to do with your low score. I don't know what happened, but I wasn't involved. Quax looked up from the pages with widened eyes. Yashi, this obsession isn't healthy. It's not good for your mind, and it's not safe either. Quax, remember when you were the top of the class? Confident, happy even? Now your grades are in the pits. You're throwing away your own future, and for what? To read too deep into something my sister did to protect me? Something she did to save me because she loves me? I'd like to leave Citra tomorrow knowing you'll stop this permanently. I promise. Let's just, let's talk about something else. Yashi reached for the articles. Here, let me- You're not getting these back. Quacks! Really? I need those! That's exactly the problem. Quacks gripped the pages firmly and began to tear them in half. Yashi's blood boiled. The ripping was all he could hear, and he made his fingers roll into a fist. <sighs> How could you just- As Quacks attempted to rip the pieces even smaller, Yashi stepped forward and landed a strike to Quacks' face. <sighs> the pieces <sighs> scattered around them. Quacks cupped a palm over his eye with a groan and Yashi hobbled away as though he'd taken the hit himself. Quax, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. <sighs> Typical. Yashi unraveled his tight fist. His knuckles tingled from a punch he had thrown without thinking. He thought of Cal in the woods, swinging the log down over and over again. A chill ran down his spine. The other students began to close in on the scene. Yashi dropped to his knees and tried to gather the pages before they could read the content. The weight of their eyes made him fumble, and the article scattered once again. He was too stunned to process their mumbling. After gathering the pages successfully, he shoved them into his bag and jumped to his feet. Are you okay? Yashi was almost delusional enough to think she had spoken to him. Yeah, thanks Alora. When Yashi looked around at the circle of students, they avoided his gaze like they were afraid of seeing their own reflections in his eyes. The students parted, forming a convenient exit for him as he ran toward the road. He despised how easily they allowed him to flee. He nearly reached the end of the courtyard when a hand snatched his wrist, stopping him. 
Yashi Kanya. He glanced back at a middle-aged man wearing the uniform of a Citra secondary instructor. He had a freshly trimmed beard, a bandaged forehead, and reddish eyes that burned to stare into. Yashi didn't recognize him from school. You did well. With a grin, he released Yashi's wrist. Belladonna, Book 1, Nightshade Academy Written and narrated by Mel Franca. Produced by Mel Franca and Wilson Hensley Edited and mastered by Juan Pablo Diaz How did we get here? Something went wrong We worked hard for this life that we don't want at all Cover art by Mad Studio Score by Jida Puspita Osri. Theme song composed and produced by James Sinclair Stott. Starring Jason Brown, Anthony Andreas Echeverri, Melissa White, Alex Bowie, Patrick Viersba, Julia Risto, David John Bors, Connor Blanc, Cody Keel, Ellie Chua. Ben Autry, Walter Mack. If it's really true that the sky weeps with us, if it's really true that heroes live in stars. Featuring the voices of Gwyneth Evans, Jay Ross, Philip Krynoff, Lucas Hensley. Levi Titus, Angie Eggers, Willem Degar, Allison Prophet, Maria Palmo. Nightshade Academy is produced in association with Lost Island Press.